Cars such as the new Consul Classic deserve fine service. In each phase of design, development and manufacture, everything has been done to ensure that this new car will give reliable and economical service. But you all know the key to customer satisfaction is service. That key is now in your hand. This film introduces the Consul Classic to you as service personnel so that you may have a brief glimpse at the major differences between this new model and previous models. It will give you a brief insight into servicing the major components so that you will have advanced knowledge before going to the Ford Service School at Langley. A total of 17 service bulletins, of which three cover bodywork, give detailed information of both two- and four-door models with either floor or column gear change. Also available are a repair operations book, a data book, wall charts, and, of course, the owner's handbook, which is supplied to the customer. In addition to this information, there will shortly be mechanics courses at the service school. I will briefly introduce the main features then the instructor will give more detailed information. Broadly speaking, the body size of the console classic can be compared with our previous Mark I console or our competitors Vauxhall Victor, Hillman Minx or the Opel Record. Now, down to business. Mechanically, the console classic can be regarded as the big brother of the highly successful Anglia. From outside, the engine appears to be the same as the Anglia. It is, in fact, similar, except for the pistons, lower compression rings, connecting rods and crankshaft, the cylinder head and the timing chain tensioner. Other components are the same as the Anglia. Two cylinder heads are available, giving different compression ratios. High compression is 8.5 to 1 for premium fuels, and 7.2 to 1 is a low compression engine for regular fuels. There are slight changes to the distributor, but the carburetor is very similar to that which is used on the present console. The next major assembly is the gearbox. The basic gearbox case and extension housing, including all the gears, except the speedometer drive gear, are Anglia components. However, two types of gear change mechanism are available. Floor change, as in the Anglia, and a new design column change, which we will deal with later in this film. Now let us look at the rear axle. The complete differential assembly is of the Anglia type, with which you are already familiar. The axle shafts, however, which are similar in design, are slightly longer, whilst the outer bearing is identical. But the inner and outer bearing retainers differ. Remember, too, when renewing this bearing and its inner retainer, that a higher load figure must be used to press these parts onto the axle shaft. See the appropriate service bulletin for this information. How about a look at the braking system? Disc brakes are fitted as standard to the front wheels, but no servo unit is required to supplement the pedal effort. Whilst we are near the front hubs, 
I will mention that the hubs need only be repacked with a lithium base grease every 15,000 miles and not 5,000 miles as on previous passenger models. The suspension is of the familiar telescopic type, whilst the steering gear is a recirculatory type worm and nut. Last but not least is the new current and voltage control regulator that we will hear more about later on. Also, the alignment of the four headlamps. Now, that's the general picture of the new console classic. So, let us get down to the detail of these features and differences I have briefly mentioned. Let me introduce Mr. Williams, our instructor, who will explain these changes to existing assemblies in more detail. As with the Anglia, the console classic has the same advantage when removing the engine, the gearbox or the rear axle. Any one of these units can be removed without disturbing the other two. Stage by stage details are contained in the service bulletins. Two points though, don't forget to remove the radiator and remember to support the front end of the gearbox before uncoupling the engine. Let's have a look at the engine itself when it's out of the car. Take the ancillaries off first. Now the cylinder head. Is it high or low compression? The letter H or L stamped on the rear manifold mounting pad will give you the answer. The valves are the same as the Anglia. Turn the engine over on the stand and then we'll take off the sump. Two baffles in the sump to prevent undue oil surge. There is a mechanical timing chain tensioner which consists of a snail cam that under the action of a torsion spring acts through the pad onto the chain. There must be a tension in the spring. If not, rotate the cam approximately two and a half turns from the free position to tension the spring and ensure that the spring end is secured behind its stop. Now for the piston rings. The upper compression ring is chrome plated and marked top to ensure that it is fitted the right way up. However, the lower compression ring is a stepped non-plated ring. The lower face and outer edge of this ring are relieved. As with the upper ring, fit the face marked top uppermost so that the relieved portion will be positioned downwards. In this view, you can see that the timing cover has two timing marks. The outer or lower mark, which is the one we are particularly interested in for the classic, represents six degrees static advance when aligned with the notch on the crankshaft pulley. Two distributors are available. One for high compression engines identified by the yellow washer on the low tension terminal on the left of this picture and the second for low compression engines can be identified by a brown washer on the low tension terminal. The high compression engine and distributor are for use with a premium grade fuel whilst the low compression engine and distributor use a regular grade fuel. These graphs illustrate the combinations of engine compression ratio, distributor and research method fuel octane ratings or numbers. You can see that the left hand graph refers to the low compression engine and distributor because in this country 83 octane is the approximate rating of our regular fuel whilst premium fuel is 96, this being represented by the yellow graph on the right. In certain export territories, however, an octane rating of 91 is more readily available. Therefore, we then use the combination shown on the centre graph, which is a high compression engine and a low compression distributor. Normally, however, you will not encounter this combination unless you should be working on a car belonging to or intended for an overseas visitor. If in any doubt as to the correct combination for any engine, consult the distributor's service bulletin or the data book. The carburetor will be familiar to all of you. Basically, it is similar to that now fitted to the Mark II console. But all the jet sizes differ. The classic carburetor also has an internally vented float chamber. 
but the main difference is to the emulsion block. You can see from this illustration that a small brass dip tube is pressed into the emulsion block, a small drilling connecting this to the atmosphere side of the main air bleed. The purpose of this dip tube is to slightly increase the quantity of fuel supplied to the emulsion block beak at higher engine speeds. When the air speed is sufficiently high through the main air bleed, fuel is drawn up the dip tube and discharged through the small bleed hole shown into the air stream passing to the well above the main jet. Now to the gearbox and the gear change mechanism. Here we see the steering column gear change. Whereas the Mark II console has the gear lever spring loaded so that when in neutral it is adjacent to the second and third gear positions, this linkage on the Classic is aligned with third and top gear positions. It is first necessary to select the appropriate selector shaft, then move this selected shaft forwards or backwards to mesh the gears. This is done by two distinct movements of the gear lever. To amplify this, select first gear. The gear lever is pulled up towards the steering wheel. This can be seen by the green coloured linkage on the screen. You will see that the shift finger has moved from the central selector shaft over to the first and second selector shaft on the right. To mesh the first gears, or to shift them, look at the diagram coloured red. This rotary movement is transmitted through the linkage and ends with the first and second gear selector shaft being moved or shifted to the rear, engaging first gear. In this picture, these two operations are combined to give you the exact representation as can be seen on the car itself. When selecting second gear, the same sequence of events takes place because the gear lever is still held upwards towards the steering wheel. However, on the shift side of the operation, shown red on this picture, this time the gear lever is moved away from the windscreen. Therefore, the shift linkage is moved in the opposite direction. But due to the fact that the shift finger is still located over the first and second gear selector shaft, the selector shaft is moved forward so engaging second gear. No movement of the gear lever towards or away from the steering wheel is required for third and top gear because when in neutral the gear lever is held down by a small spring and the shift finger is located in the third and top gear gate. Therefore movement of the shift linkage only is required. No adjustment is provided for the linkage that meshes or shifts the gears. For the linkage which engages the selector shaft, an adjustment is provided, and this must be properly set. With the gear change lever in the third and top gear position, the shift finger must be in the centre of this third and top selector shaft. The top right-hand diagram shows the shift finger, coloured green, incorrectly positioned. But below in the other diagram it is correct. If it is possible to engage all gears then the selector linkage is set correctly and the shift finger is located in the centre of the third and top selector shaft. If all gears cannot be obtained place the gear lever in third or top gear. Adjust the rod at the extreme right of this picture until the lower part of the bell crank lever is at right angles to the centre line of the car. Now adjust the two lock nuts on the transverse selector rod at the left of the diagram until there is a clearance of 0.4 inches between the steering gear housing and the gear shift arm as shown here. Check that all gears can be engaged. If the gears do not engage freely it is necessary to alter the effective length of the transverse selector rod. If all gears except first and second engage, lengthen the rod. Turn the lock nuts two turns to do this and recheck. Continue to lengthen the rod two turns at a time until first and second gear can be engaged. 
If, however, it is found that reverse gear cannot be engaged, then the transverse selector rod must be shortened in a similar manner. When all gears are obtainable, tighten the lock nuts. In principle, the clutch release mechanism is similar to the Mark II, and clutch adjustment may be carried out in the same manner. However, the release arm on the Classic is retained to the fulcrum pin by means of a spring, which is shown in this illustration. Remember, when replacing the release arm, to locate the retaining spring ends in the two holes provided in the release arm. Then, slide the central loop of the spring under the fulcrum pin head. Notice that the release bearing is retained to the release arm by two single coil springs and a semicircular link, which deserve a closer look. The link fits between the release bearing and arm, locating in grooves provided in both. Two single coil springs retain the release bearing to the release arm, and when assembling these, note that the ends with the almost complete coils must be fitted to the bearing, and the other ends attached to the release arm. The steering gear is of the recirculating ball type, as in the Anglia. To remove it, withdraw it through the interior of the car. For both floor and column change cars, the removal procedures are similar, except that with a column change vehicle, additional operations are necessary to remove the gear change linkage. The recirculatory ball type steering gear is in effect a worm and nut with ball bearings taking the place of threads. When overhauling the steering gear, if it is found necessary to fit new bushes, note that the upper rocker shaft bush is pre-sized. The lower rocker shaft bush must be replaced and then broached after it's been fitted to the steering box. This can be done on a hydraulic press with the broaching kit illustrated here. Don't forget to wash out the swarf when the operation has been completed. Note there are 51 balls in the steering box, 10 for each bearing and 31 for the steering nut, all the same size, 9 30 seconds of an inch in diameter. When reassembling, don't forget to account for them all. Preload the steering shaft bearings 2 to 4 thou. Whilst the steering gear is removed from the car, it may be found advisable to change the gear shift arm bush. This is of the oil impregnated type and it must be fitted with the correct size mandrel to ensure that the designed running clearance is maintained. If it's assembled with an ordinary punch or drift, it will close and so prevent the gear change linkage from functioning correctly. Rocker shaft adjustment can be carried out with the steering gear remaining in the car, although for simplicity our illustration shows it on the bench. With the steering box top cover removed, set the nut in the centre of its run on the steering shaft. This can be done by counting the number of turns from lock to lock and then turning back half that amount. This will position the rocker shaft at right angles to the steering shaft. Fit the top cover, the shim pack and the small cover plate, but don't fit the two thrust springs at this stage. Check the rocker shaft end float by dial gauge as shown. If necessary, removing shims to reduce this end float to two thou. Then remove a further four thou shim to slightly preload the bearings. Rocker shaft preload must be naught to three thou. Now remove the small cover plate, refit the two thrust springs and replace the small cover plate shims and gaskets. Let us take a look at the braking system. Disc brakes on the front are fitted as standard, similar to those fitted on the Mark II. This cutaway view shows the layout of the caliper and disc. Note there is a shim located between each piston skirt and brake pad. 
The brake consists essentially of a disc bolted to the wheel hub and a caliper which straddles the disc. In the caliper, there is a piston in each cylinder, one on each side of the disc. When the brake is applied, fluid pressure applied to the pistons forces them against the support plates and brake pads, gripping the disc. An important feature of disc brakes is that no adjustment is either provided or required. To check the extent of pad wear, just remove the wheel and measure the thickness of the lining material attached to the support plate. When this is down to one-eighth of an inch and never less than one-sixteenth of an inch, change the pads. To renew the brake pads, first remove the retaining clip which secures each retaining pin. Withdraw the pins and then remove the brake pads and shims. On reassembly, make sure that the semicircular cutout in the shim is towards the bottom half of the pad and that the arrow is pointing in the direction of rotation of the disc. If the existing pads are to be reused, always ensure that they are refitted to their original location. Here is an exploded view of the caliper assembly and this is the extent to which it can be stripped. Do not attempt to separate the two halves of the caliper bolted together with the four bolts shown here. Should a hydraulic leak occur that cannot be remedied by changing the piston seals, renew the assembly. When assembling a caliper, fit the piston seal in the inner annular groove in the cylinder bore, then locate the sealing bellows in the outer annular groove. Fit the piston, crown first, through the sealing bellows, then, as the piston is pushed right in, as shown here, locate the inner lip on the bellows in the annular groove provided in the piston skirt. Should a new hub, disc or bearings have been fitted, check the disc runout, as this could have an adverse effect on the braking action. A dial gauge, positioned near the center of the swept area of the disc, should be used. The maximum permissible runout is 4 thou. If in excess of this, check and rectify. Causes of runout may be the bearing cups not seating correctly or foreign matter between the mating faces of hub and disc. The rear brakes are of the more familiar drum type, the external handbrake linkage being very similar to that for the Anglia. The adjuster is the usual wedge and tappet arrangement, where the adjuster wedge is turned clockwise to lock the drum. Turn back two clicks to obtain the normal running clearance. With the drum removed, you can see the new type shoe retaining clip, which replaces the two dished washers and coil spring on our other models. To centralize the brakes and the drum, the wheel cylinder is not free to float, but the handbrake or mechanical linkage is allowed to float over the wheel cylinder to which it is attached. Therefore, every time the handbrake is applied, it maintains the shoes in a centralized position. If one shoe contacts the drum first, the handbrake expander has to slide sideways in the elongated slots until the other shoe touches the drum. Those of you who know the Mark I console and Zephyr will be quite familiar with this system. These are the parts that comprise this handbrake expander assembly. Note the slotted or elongated holes. Also, the stop pegs to limit the tappet travel. Remember, after assembling the handbrake expander to the wheel cylinder, the expander must be free to slide relative to the wheel cylinder. If it is not free to slide, it could mean incorrect brake adjustment, and on application of the brakes, only one shoe would come into contact with the drum. 
A rear wheel cylinder is shown here. To be particularly mentioned are the pistons. They have similar spigots at each end, but the longer spigot is the one to which the piston seal must be fitted, and this spigot is entered into the wheel cylinder first. The master cylinder for this car has a reservoir of extra large capacity. This is to hold enough fluid to compensate for pad wear on the disc brakes. Although the piston has two piston seal grooves, only one seal is fitted to the forward end of the piston. When bleeding the hydraulic system, always start with the front brakes. First, bleed the caliper having the shorter pipeline. Then the caliper on the opposite side of the car. There are only three bleed points on the car, the last being on the left-hand rear back plate. Before we leave the braking system, again note there is no servo unit required on this model. The front lighting. This consists of four headlamps and two side lamps. Each headlamp is a sealed beam unit consisting of a bulb, lens, and reflector. When the main beam position is selected, all four headlamps are on. When the dipped beam position is selected, only the two outer headlamps are on. To remove a sealed beam unit, remove the cross head screws at the side of the headlamp outer bezel and rotate the bezel slightly in an anti-clockwise direction so that the locating pin in the bezel disengages from the corresponding hole in the mount. The outer bezel can now be removed. Slacken the three crosshead screws securing the outer rim to the body, turn the rim slightly in an anti-clockwise direction and remove. The sealed beam unit can now be moved forward from its location and the plug, two pin on inner lamps, three pin on the outer lamps, removed. To replace the unit, reverse this procedure. Two adjusting screws are provided on each headlamp. The upper screw adjusts the beam vertically, and the lower screw adjusts the beam horizontally. In order to obtain access to these screws, the outer bezel must first be removed. Each headlamp is aligned independently by adjusting the beam pattern on a darkened board size 35 inches by 16 inches. To align the headlamps, the car must be unladen and standing on level ground. Bounce the car to ensure correct settlement of the suspension and then measure the height H from the ground to the headlamp center. Position the aiming board 10 feet from the headlamps and adjust the board so that the horizontal dividing line is H minus half an inch above the ground and the vertical center line is aligned with the vertical center of the left hand outer headlamp. Switch onto dipped beam and cover the right hand outer headlamp. By means of the two adjusting screws on the left hand outer headlamp, adjust the position of the dark light boundary projected until it coincides with the board pattern now shown. When the dipped beam has been adjusted, the lamp can be considered correctly set for the main beam position. Repeat the procedure for the right hand outer headlamp using the same board pattern but in its new location in front of the right hand lamps. Switch to main beam and adjust in turn each inner headlamp at the same time covering its adjacent outer headlamp. Using the aiming board with the main beam pattern, position the board with the horizontal dividing line as previously and with the vertical dividing line aligned with the vertical center of the inner left hand headlamp. Adjust the beam until the dark light boundary coincides with the board pattern shown. Repeat the procedure for the inner right hand lamp. On the extreme end of the direction indicator switch is the headlamp flasher control. Irrespective of the position of the normal lighting switch, operation of the flasher control will illuminate all the lights at the front of the car. 
To replace a side and front direction indicator bulb, remove the two screws securing the lens to the body, after which the lens can be removed and the bayonet type bulb replaced. When fitting the lens, make sure that the gasket is positioned evenly. Now to the regulator. This is mounted below the fascia on the left hand cowl side panel. The regulator differs from the previous type in that three separate units instead of two are included. The cutout is basically the same as before, but the current and voltage are regulated independently by means of separate coils. The cutout, current regulator, and voltage regulator coils each have an adjusting screw. We now see the cutout adjusting screw. In this picture, we see the voltage and the current regulator screws. When carrying out any adjustment, it is important that this is done as a complete sequence as outlined in the service bulletin. Now we come to the car body. In general, component fitting follows a pattern already familiar to some of you on Anglia and Mark II models. The windscreen glass, chrome mouldings and weather strip comprise an assembly very similar to Mark II 1959 onwards. Fitting procedure is to mark the centre of the screen and moulding as shown, then fit the rubber weather strip to the glass, insert the chrome mouldings into the weather strip and fit a draw cord in the appropriate groove of the weather strip. Sealer is then applied between the glass and weather strip and at the weather strip to body location. The assembly can then be offered to the aperture and fitted into position by pulling the draw cord. As with Mark II models, to renew any section of chrome, it is necessary to first remove the windscreen. The outside vertical edges of the weather strip are then covered by chrome finish mouldings secured to the windscreen pillars. Internally, when the belt rail panel finish cover has been fitted, this lipping tool is needed for fitting the weather strip to the cover. Before we leave the subject of glass fitting, the rear window assembly consists of a glass and a rubber weather strip. Removal and refitting procedure is similar to that for Anglia models. The headlining is secured in a similar manner to Mark II models by listing wires, retainer strips and adhesive. As on Mark II models, the toothed side retainer strips, which are shown in this picture, extend the full length of the headlining, which is secured by adhesive at the windscreen and rear window apertures only. Removal and replacement of door interior fittings is very similar to Anglia cars, except for the rear doors on four-door models. These doors have opening vent windows, which pivot on a dowel screw passing through the door and vent window frame as shown. To remove a rear door vent window frame, therefore, it is necessary to first remove the vent window glass. This must also be done to remove the door window glass. Two door models have opening rear quarter windows which are hinged on the forward edge and are secured on the rear edge by an over centre catch. Access to the forward hinge is gained by removing the door lock pillar cover plate. The bonnet release catch operates through a spring-loaded lever which is situated under the parcel tray. Turning the lever operates a cable which releases locking catches located at either side of the engine compartment. Adjustment for the cable is provided at each locking catch. Should any difficulty be experienced in operating the release mechanism in the normal way, holes are provided in the engine compartment bulkhead panel normally filled with rubber plugs through which the catches can be released. We can now move on to the body construction as distinct from body components. The console classic follows the modern trend of an all welded unitized structure suitably reinforced to accommodate the chassis and mechanical components. 
The underbody is comprised of two parallel longitudinal box members to which the floor panels and engine compartment are welded. The engine compartment is designed to accommodate a telescopic type of front suspension and the rear end is designed for an orthodox rear axle with semi-elliptic rear suspension. The front mudguards are secured by bolts, flat washers and spring washers. Sufficient clearance is given at all bolt holes to allow a limited movement during fitting so that a satisfactory fit to surrounding parts may be obtained. The side lamp cover is attached to the radiator grill surround extension panel by a nut and washer and two self-tapping screws. The cover must be removed to gain access to securing bolts when detaching a front mudguard. To prevent unsightly mud stains on the upper bodywork, all jointing faces of the front mudguard to surrounding body sections are sealed with a water-resistant bulk sealer. In addition, the joint lines of the side lamp cover are also sealed and are painted to match the body colour. The rear quarter panels in the areas below the rear window level are secured in a similar manner to previous cars. However, the console classic rear quarter panel extends only to a line level with the lower edge of the rear window. At this point, the panel is gas welded at each side to the underlying body structure. The body section at this point, between the rear quarter panel and the roof panel, is covered by an applique or planton plate which also covers the gas weld joint we've just mentioned. This is a feature which will prove of great value to the body repair shop since it will facilitate panel replacement in accident damage repairs. Regarding lubrication and maintenance, longer periods between services for certain components is a new feature. Some items are removed from the usual 5,000 mile service and a 15,000 mile service has been introduced instead. The items which require revised attention are 1. Change gearbox and rear axle oil at 15,000 mile intervals. 2. Repack the front hub bearings with grease at 15,000 mile intervals. And 3. Top up the front and rear shock absorbers at 15,000 mile intervals. There are 11 grease gun points on the car which must be lubricated with a multi-purpose lithium base grease at every 1,000 miles. It is usual to lubricate these points when a new car comes in for its first 300 mile service. However, with this model, at the first 300 mile service, do not lubricate the four track rod ball joints, shown here. They are packed with a special grease that should be left undisturbed in these ball joints during the first 1,000 miles. Where a steering column change is fitted, this linkage must also be lubricated with a lithium base grease at 1,000 mile intervals. There are three oil impregnated bushes which must not be lubricated and their location is shown in this picture. These new features in lubrication and maintenance are all detailed on the lubrication and maintenance wall chart shown here, which is readily available. These details are also included in the owner's handbook supplied with the car. Make sure that you are quite familiar with these new instructions before working on a vehicle. That concludes our film. As we remarked at the beginning, our objective has been to highlight the important servicing aspects and, in particular, those points which differ from previous practice. Remember, the degree of satisfaction which the owner gets from his console classic will, in the final count, depend on the service he receives, the service which you give. So take full advantage of all the service information and training available and back us up in making service our strongest link.